culture is movement. All culture is exchange of culture. A story or an image or a historical event can move across cultures and acquire different meaning and different values as it moves across cultures. I've long been fascinated by this and it's informed quite a lot of my work over the last few years, teaching, writing, researching. And I'm particularly interested as, for example, I'm a drummer in a samba band. And samba, after all, is African rhythms and African drums that were taken to the New World through the cruel migration of slavery, fused with European rhythms and the snare, mixed with a fair amount of indigenous rhythms, emerged as a potent cultural form of resistance, rebellion, and celebration in Brazil. Now performed the length and breadth of the British Isles and Europe as a potent blend and a potent mix of resistance, rebellion, protest, and celebration. I love that. I'm also interested in the fact that a historical person can move across cultures and acquire new values and new meanings in the new culture. And in fact, this, mo this morning we heard a wonderful talk by Paul about the uh, presence of Shakespeare in China. And on that note, I'm interested in the fact that, uh, that John Lennon is Cuban. I'll explain. So I sat on a park bench in Havana next to John Lennon, and I offered him a cigarette. It's a quiet place, leafy, shady. The distant hum of Havana is quiet. He didn't say much because he's made of bronze. In fact, I don't think he said anything at all. I sat there for a while. He wasn't... I noticed that beneath his feet are the words, Dirías que soy un soñador, pero no soy el único. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. He wasn't wearing any glasses, but after a while a kindly old man appeared and placed on his face the trademark round glasses that John always wore. And John looked more like John now. I chatted with the old man for a bit. What's with the glasses, I said. Bueno. People would steal them, so I guard them for safekeeping. Why would people steal his glasses? Bueno. A holy relic, I suppose. I chatted for a while with him, and I asked him something that was on my mind. I said, it's curious as a statue to John Lennon. Wasn't it prohibited in Cuba only a few decades ago to listen to the Beatles? Bueno, said the old man. Todo cambia. Everything changes. What a lovely response. Well, I've returned to this park on many occasions, and I've sat next to John on many occasions and spoken with him. And on one particular occasion, there were a group of musicians sitting in a circle in the grass with guitars, long hair, singing Beatles songs. And they beckoned me over. Well, I was born and brought up singing Beatles songs with my mother in the car. I know many of the songs intimately, so I went and joined them. Sang them a few songs, sang with them. They were good. They were, not me. And they asked me what some of the songs meant. Well, you know, some of the songs are quite easy to translate. All you need is love. Love is all you need. But I was rather stumbled across some of John's more zany lyrics. I am the walrus was particularly tricky. <laughs> Although I could manage goo 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 -jube. Well, this park has not always been called Parque Lenon. Not to be confused with Parque Lenin, also in Havana. In fact, it used to be called Parque Menocal, named after General Aurelio Menocal, the third president of the Republic of Cuba from 1913 to 1921. And there was once a bus to Menocal in the park, but it was broken up in the early days of the revolution. None of the musicians I spoke with in the park had any idea that the park used to be called Parque Menocal. In fact, only a couple of them had ever heard of Menocal. But they could all sing Help, and they could all sing Yellow Submarine. Well, there's something a little absurd about busts and statues in city parks across the world. The novelist Garcia Marquez talks of statues that are not toppled with a new regime, but are simply renamed. 
Statues of Francisco Franco have been progressively removed across civic spaces all over Spain over the last few decades. One was removed, an equestrian statue of Franco was removed from his natal town of Ferrol in Galicia in 2002. And another was removed from Santander in 2008. Both statues were perpetually daubed, as I saw, in red paint and angry graffiti. And there's recently been a square named in honor of Margaret Thatcher in Madrid. Unfortunately, the plans for the Plaza Margaret Thatcher did not extend to an equestrian statue. There's nothing to throw red paint at, nothing to graffiti. So with this in mind, I asked the musicians if they'd ever heard of the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, friends of Lennon and McCartney, and they hadn't. So I sang to them equestrian statue. There once was a very famous man. On his famous horse he rode across the land. The people used to see him everywhere. When he died, they put a statue in the square. Hooray! Well, hooray for John Lennon, sitting on a park bench in Havana, not lording over it, inviting space beside him, sharing the space. This was as the sculptor Jose Villa intended. Now, Villa had already made statues of Che Guevara and Jose Martí, so he was no stranger to heroic totems. But with John, he wanted no heroic gesture, no pedestal. He felt that John would want to interact and share the space, and he does. And John looks like he belongs in Havana. He looks Cuban. Loose clothing, relaxed posture. He looks like he spends all day sitting on a bench in a park, which he does. This, again, was as the sculptor Jose Villa intended. I was lucky enough to meet Jose Villa, and I congratulated him on the statue, because I think it's wonderful. But I also asked him what was troubling me. I said, this, I asked him about this historical irony, the fact that listening to the Beatles was prohibited, and that to listen to the Beatles carried some risk. Bueno, he said, todo cambia, just like the old man in the park had said. But then he also said, John Lennon has helped heal old wounds. What a lovely idea that is. So the statue was unveiled in the year 2000 on the 20th anniversary of John's murder in New York. And it was unveiled by Fidel Castro himself with the singer Silvio Rodriguez. But Silvio was a man who'd suffered in the early days of the revolution when he was a young and upcoming musician of La Nueva Trova. He'd been taken off air and had been prohibited from performing on the television and on radio, primarily on account of what he'd said about the Beatles. He'd praised their musicianship. He'd praised their harmonies and their melodies. And so I'm intrigued to consider the tension that must have been present between Fidel Castro and Silvio Rodriguez as they uncovered the veil of John Lennon. But I'm also intrigued at the versatility of meaning of the statue of John Lennon. You see, Silvio's John is primarily a musician. The sculptor Jose Villa's John is primarily a pacifist. Fidel Castro's John is an anti-imperialist warrior akin to Che Guevara. And this was immediately evident from the speech that was given by Fidel's deputy, Ricardo Alarcón, who praised John's defiance of the U.S. immigration authorities, his denouncement of racism in the U.S., his support of the protesters against the war in Vietnam and the draft dodgers and the deserters, his defiance of Richard Nixon and, let's not forget, his returning of the MBE to the Queen. Well, this is John the ex beatle this is John the revolutionary, John the militant. This is John who's wearing the black beret of Che Guevara. This is not the John who sang, Well, I don't want to be a soldier, mama. I don't want to die. There's a touching story of a 14-year-old called Jerry who snuck into John's hotel room in Toronto in 1969 
and hit John with some dazzling questions. What can we, says Jerry, what can we as a youth of Toronto do to help you? Help me by helping yourselves, was John's pragmatic response. And he continued, find anywhere where the revolutionaries are at it and see if any of them fulfill on their promises. What they do is they smash the system down and they bro then they build the system up and then the revolutionaries become the establishment. You see, John's revolution was not armed. John's revolution was not militant. Happiness was not a warm gun. But when you talk about destruction, don't you know that you can count me out? And so, I'm intrigued by this question of John. There's a cynic in me that urges me to focus on this jagged historical process and to consider the tension. There's a cynic in me which looks at this strange historical irony as if I've cracked some dark conspiracy. And as I sat there next to John, I looked up at him. Well, I looked aside at him. He wasn't up above me. And I thought, what did he think when, John, when Fidel Castro had unveiled him? Had he bristled being celebrated by a soldier statesman, one of these revolutionaries who tore down the establishment and then built it up again? Has he been in any way betrayed? Well, all the people I spoke to in Havana indicate there's no betrayal at all. John the Revolutionary is celebrated by revolutionaries in a land whose political system still calls itself revolutionary. The musicians I spoke with in the park, the musicians I sang with in the park, they loved John. They loved the music of the Beatles. They were unconcerned of the social tensions of 40 or 50 years ago. The old man of the glasses simply shrugged, todo cambia. The sculptor, Jose Vija, urged me to consider John in the present, what the statue means for the people who used to rally together in the park and grow their hair and wear leather jackets and sing Beatles songs when to do so carried some risk. You see, John Lennon, years after his death, continues to rebel and resist and rattle the authorities. But he also encourages others to resist and rebel and rattle the authorities. But he also encourages reconciliation and the rectification of errors. Juan Lennon, de los Beatles, sits quietly in a park bench in Havana. The square is named after him. And people bring him flowers and rum and tobacco and ask him for guidance and ask him for help. It is, in some respects, a shrine, a temple, a holy place. So what is the spirit that people are interacting with in this park in Havana? Who is this spirit who embodies this statue? Well... He's a spirit who encourages peace and love and balance and harmony and music and love. The statue says, sit, relax, be peaceful, sing, make music, love. Don't be angry. Don't be aggressive. This is the spirit that the statue embodies. Well, of course, the statue of John Lennon won't bring world peace any more than John Lennon brought world peace. But the statue can encourage peacefulness. It is a peaceful place. And to be peaceful is to embody peacefulness. It is to exude peacefulness and inspire peacefulness. And sure enough, the park is a calm and peaceful place. And I would rather sit next to John Lennon than stare up at the patrician figure of some former president of the Republic. The stern moustaches, the frock coat, the top hat and the sword. I mean, what songs would Menocal inspire rather than military marching songs? Who the hell was Menocal?
Yes, you see. John seems more Cuban than Menocal. John is a totem, a totem of a community who were instructed to rebel, but not to rebel against the people who instructed them to rebel. But they rebelled as instructed, and this is their legacy. You see, the statue of John Lennon was conceived and built as an act of resistance. Three men, one a poet, two musicians, crossing the Abbey Road zebra crossing in London, the end of the 1990s, first came up with the idea of having a statue of John Lennon in Havana. Not only in celebration of John Lennon, but also in recognition of the people who had long gathered in this park and defiantly sung Beatles songs and grown their hair. So this is what the statue is saying. I thought long and long about this, and I was only there recently in January. In this time, when the fabric and the infrastructure of our society is being increasingly eroded and dismantled. You look at the statue of John Lennon and see this was created by people who had a dream, exactly as John instructed. And there it was, an act of resistance that is now on the tourist brochures and tourist guides. There is a park now officially named after him, and a statue officially there, celebrated, the heart of Havana. And so the message from that is, don't wait for the initiatives of the policy makers. They rarely have any. Don't wait for authorization. Don't wait for ideas to come from on top. Act, perform, sing, create. Do it. Do it now. That's what the statue of John Lennon was saying to me. That's why the statue was conceived. That's why the statue was cast in bronze. That's why musicians gather in the park and sing Beatles songs. That's why Silvio unveiled the statue and then sang a beautiful rendition of John's 1970 song, Love. Love is real. Real is love. That's why people bring John flowers, rum, and tobacco. That's why I offered John a cigarette, which I think he kept for later. Muchas gracias.